Welcome back to the Service Management Leadership Podcast. We have a, a guest that's been on with us before, one of my very favorite guests, David Cannon. David, how are you today? Hi, Jeffrey. I'm great. Thank you. It's good to be back again. Always good to be here. Oh, yes. And we've talked on previous podcasts, meeting in person, all that fun stuff. But I wanted to have you on today specifically because of the recent launch or release of your new book, the on ITIL 4 Cloud. Can you talk to us and tell us about it? Well, yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, the, the, this is the latest release uh, in ITIL. It is one of the extension modules. So you have the core modules, and then next to them are a, a couple of extension modules. Um, a little bit different to the supplementary materials. So we have supplementary materials and supplementary books, which kind of complement the core materials or expand on them. This is alongside the core materials, and it is all about how to acquire and manage cloud services. In fact, that's the name of the book. It's called Acquiring and Managing Cloud Services, uh, or AMCS, if you like. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I believe it's, it's one of the very few publications out there, if not the only one at this point, which talks about cloud from a consumer organization point of view. Uh, we're, we're very we're very happy about it. It's um, it, it it came out very different to what I was expecting when we went into it, but uh, we're, we're very we're very excited about it. And let me let me reiterate what I heard just to make sure it's an extension, so it's a broader than the core ITIL books, right? which previously had only gone deeper. This is one that extends the breadth some. Right. So this is this is not about, uh, for example, how to use digital and IT strategy in the cloud or how to use, um, you know, direct uh, plan and improve in the cloud. It, it is a different book altogether. It's all about cloud. It's about it's about using and acquiring and managing cloud services for your organization. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's a big pain point. I remember four years ago now I got a call to go help some an organization, they went to a 100% cloud or 0% data center model, huge, huge US company. And they're like, how do we do service management? And my wheels turn. Okay, we have a CMDB problem we have to solve. We have a finance problem we have to solve. We have a supplier management problem we have to solve. And even the way cloud assets are onboarded, utilized, decommissioned, I just thought, this is a great book, well positioned. So, how can org how can organizations use this book to address these and other issues like change and service continuity and all the other stuff? Well, you know the the, the great thing about this book is is we had uh, a couple of beta uh, classes around it just to familiarize people with the material and get feedback and so on. And uh, one of the one of the best comments, and it was consistent across uh, across various groups, was I wish I'd had this book six months ago. Okay. It's it's um, it's relevant. This is this is not just about organizations that are starting out on their cloud journey, but this uh, it is for them as well. But it's also for organizations like the one that you mentioned, who says I'm in the cloud now. Um, now I have some uh, some things I need to I need to deal with. How do I go about doing that? And I think um, I think the first thing that we uh, that we try to focus on is what is different about cloud services than managing services in your own data center. They are very different. At the same time, one of the important factors is if you've moved something into the cloud and you didn't know what it was before it went into the cloud, you're going to have ten times the problem dealing with it in the cloud. So it's really important that service management uh, um, disciplines, uh, capabilities, and so on are well in place before you move into the cloud. And if they're not, you have to get them there as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I, I remember oh, uh, I was uh, 10 years ago, uh, we were writing the, the uh, service strategy book in version three. And uh, we had some cloud people uh, in the company that I worked in, large, uh, large vendor, who said, you know, this cloud thing is coming along. You service management people are going to be obsolete. <laughs> we don't need you anymore because all of service management is done in the cloud. And of course, what they were thinking about was things like redundant systems, 
right? So you, you didn't have to spin up uh, spare capacity and so on. It was all there and available. But of course, what's more important about service management is understanding what is it that your organization is trying to achieve and why would cloud be the best thing to do to help them achieve that? And then once you've done that, how do you keep those cloud services enabling your organization to keep meeting those objectives and to keep expanding and growing those objectives over time? Yeah. And that is really what service management is about. It's not just about fixing incidents or creating more reliable systems. It is about meeting the objectives of your organization uh, through investing in technology. So, <clears throat> you know, service management becomes absolutely critical. Uh, there's, there's another piece to this as well, and that is that, you know, every organization, whether it's official or not, has an operating model. Operating model are those pieces of the organization that make it work. Yeah. Their um, skills, capabilities, technology, their uh, partners, their, their processes, their, their any component in the organization that makes the organization, to, organization work. Now, when you move to the cloud, what you're doing is you're taking some of those components of the operating model and you're moving them from something that you have full control over into something that you have only indirect control over, or you only have control over an output, not the actual equipment itself. That's very different. So you're in fact shifting the control that you have over the components of your operating model. Now, there's only two reasons why you would ever want to do that. And I think this is a really important thing that gets lost on a number of organizations. You know, organizations see the promise, oh, this is gonna save us money, so let's move it into the cloud. There are only two things that you wanna move into the cloud. One is, it's something that has become so commoditized that somebody else can do it more cheaply and take that headache off your plate so that your staff can work on something of a higher value. Yes, That's one reason. The second reason is because some cloud service provides you with a capability that you do not yet have. And it's the quickest, easiest, and perhaps even cheapest way that you can acquire that expertise or that, that capability so that you can grow your business. Those are the only two reasons why you would want to move into cloud. And the really important thing about both of those is that both of those scenarios, you are using something that is highly commoditized generally standardized, it is not like we would go to our traditional vendors or outsourcing company and say, hey, I want you to craft a solution for me. They don't do that. They're cloud service providers. They provide the reason that they exist is because they take something that is commonly done throughout the industry. They pool all of the resources and uh, therefore do it very cheaply. The, the, the counter side of that is that everybody who uses that service gets the same thing. You know, they, 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 certainly you can buy upgrades or downgrades or different tiers of right. performance or whatever, but essentially it's the same service. And I, I think a lot of organizations who moved into the cloud very quickly found out the, the hard way that cloud services are have limited customizability. Yes. Um, and if you do customize them, it comes at huge expense. Yes. And I want to take it a step further for you. If there are, there are several types of cloud, and so take something like change enablement, and I told for change management, I told V3, those cloud vendors, you say, hey, I want you to be part of our change, and they're going to laugh at you. And if you say, yeah. I want you to be part of our service continuity exercise, they're going to laugh at you. So that's why I'm building on what you said, that you have to have it mapped. So I'm getting back to service mapping, service level management, the key basics of ITIL, and say, we got to do this well so we know which part's us, which part's the vendor, we know in between, and we right. know how to measure. Is that seem right. Reasonable? So yeah, there's this, uh, there's this component, um, which is absolutely critical to every cloud relationship. And that is the thing, this thing called the shared responsibility model. And the shared responsibility model, and every cloud service provider has one. The shared responsibility model says, this is what we do. This is what you do. And we're not responsible for what you do. And you're not responsible for what we do. 
And that's it. And it's take it or leave it, by the way. There's right. no, you know, I, I, I try to compare it to buying a book. You know, cloud services are like going into a bookstore and taking a book off the shelf and going to the, going to the cashier and paying for it. You either want the book or you don't. Right. No bookstore is going to uh, accept your offer to take two books off the shelf and say, right, I want page one through 33 of the first one. I want you to take the pages 35 to 38 out of that one and put it into that book. And, and that's the service I want. They're not going to do that. Right. It, it's take it or leave it. So the shared responsibility model is, is so important that that you know exactly what it is you're getting into when you get into that relationship. I mean, you'll see it on, on social media. You'll see the discussions around cloud. Uh, you know, we can't get our cloud service provider to include us in the problem management uh, process. Well, why on earth would they? Right. right. You know, problem management is about, you know, root causes and prevention and so on. <laughs> if... Um, AWS or Azure or Google has a problem with one of their infrastructure, why on earth would they include their service customers in that? Right. It's internal to them. Yep. You know, what you're doing is you are submitting an incident. They're quite happy to involve you in their incident management process, but very unlikely that their problem management process is going to extend into your organization. So, and, and very unlikely that they will allow your problem management process to extend into their organization, unless it's in the form of an incident. So these are some, some areas I think if, if organizations have not gone through that shared responsibility model in enough detail, these are the kind of gray areas that kind of come out later. And, you know, change, change enablement is another big one, of course, because, you know, um, some, some categories of change you can make yourself, some categories of change you have to request and pay for. That's different. Uh, how do you know which? And if you, unless you've done the due diligence beforehand, you can end up in some very confusing situations and many organizations have. Yeah. So the shared, uh, you know, as you point out, the shared responsibility model is, is, um, is, is, is a very important, uh, very important thing to go through. Um, one other thing, since we're talking about... Um, changes. I mean, you think about, I'll just use a commonly used one, um, Office 365. How many new features get released on Office 365 per day? Oh, wow. right? It's like updating some PowerPoint feature or adding right. a button in here or taking something out and so on and so forth. I'll tell you, guaranteed that Microsoft or anybody else for that matter is not going to come to you and um, you know put that through your change management process, nope. change management process. What they're going to do is they're going to release a statement which says, here are all the changes that are coming down the line. And here's the schedule for those changes. It's up to you as a consumer of those services to figure out now who is dependent on those on those pieces of functionality and do I need to change anything so that those users can continue to work or so that we can continue to meet that objective? Or is there something that is now becoming obsolete that I can no longer depend on? What's my alternative? The cloud service provider is not going to do that for you. So right. it's really important, again, service management, the ability to map what the service is to what it's being used for and how it's being used becomes absolutely critical your CMDB, your, um, uh, your, your service portfolio. All of these are incredibly important because you need to be able to map the dependencies. Um, you know, when it's in-house, you can kind of fudge it a little bit because you know who to pick up the phone to. Yeah. You know, when you're dealing, when you're one of a thousand customers who are using the same service from a service provider, not so easy. Two parts I want to build on. One is yeah. you have to have very good supplier management practices yeah. in terms of financials, legal, all that. The other, you mentioned Microsoft, and I'm glad you did. Facebook's the easy pickings for the last couple of weeks. But a few months ago, Microsoft had a couple of configuration changes that had caused outages. And unless they breached an SLA, they don't owe you anything. And uh, since then, they've been very good about sending out these notifications. Uh, here's what's coming. 
you know, move or get out of the way because it's coming. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, I, you know, I, I think, again, a lot of people say, well, the cloud relationship, the relationship I have with my cloud service provider is really strategic. I can pretty much guarantee that the cloud service provider does not feel the same way about your organization, exactly. right? It's, it's <laughs> No, uh, Microsoft, I don't want to use their name too often, but, you know, Microsoft has multiple business units in multiple ways. There are some areas where Microsoft will consider you to be very strategic to them, but their cloud services, not so much. Um, <clears throat> you know, unless a thousand different organizations come to them and say, we want you to change this feature, not very likely that's going to happen. Um, or unless you're an extremely large account and you, you know, if they lose you, there's, it's going to damage them. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but even then, I, I think, you know, the whole point, it's like, I, this is, what, this is how I think of it. I go into, um, my, my local steakhouse in the days when we, when we could, <laughs> Going to the local steakhouse and, you know, I can order my steak medium rare and I can order whatever sides I want with it. And I can even specify what kind of spices I'd like, you know, I'd like that extra spicy or I'd like, you know, whatever the case is. Try doing that at McDonald's. Right. Right. It's, you know, the best that can happen is you can get them to hold the pickles. Right. Uh, and, and the lettuce and, and, and tomato. That, that, that's about it. But pretty much you, you get what you get. And that's it. it it's, and, and, and using cloud services is very similar to that. The reason why you use cloud services is because they are consistent, standard, and they are cheap. That is why we use fast food. It's the same kind of, the same kind of deal. Now, if you uh, say to your family, you know what, from now on, um, it's uh, fast food first. Well, you know, what are you going to get? Right. So, so as many organizations did, right? Cloud first. Yeah, great for many things, but not for everything. Yep. And so, you know, you it's like it's it's like putting your family on a fast food strategy, you know, fast food first strategy. Um, yeah, it's good for some things, but it's not good for everything. And over the over the long term, yeah, you there's a lot of stuff you want to take control over. There's a lot of stuff you want to bring back in the house. And I think yeah. that's what a lot of organizations are finding. Yep. Um, I, yeah, I want to cut you off there because I'm re I'm reminded of the 20 years ago when they had the movie Super Size Me because that's what <laughs> happens to budgets going all cloud first. Now, two things I do want to address. One is I do think cloud vendors are incentivized to be more secure than your local data center. I think because because Amazon, if they have a breach. It's, it's rough because they could lose a lot of business. So they're incentivized to be secure. Does that seem reasonable? That, that is, uh, I, I think, more than reasonable. I think you're absolutely right. If you want to look at state-of-the-art security, you, you really want to look to the cloud providers. If, if they're going to make sure that, that services are fit for use, for thousands of customers, they have to make sure that those are secure. Yeah. Um, however, the way you use the cloud may not be. Exactly. So you can be in this highly secure environment uh, holding the fire door open yep. and everybody coming in, right? It's possible within the cloud. If you, if you configure your containers wrong or your buckets wrong, uh, people can get in there. People can access your data. Uh, if you don't manage the, um, uh, the uh, rights and the identity of legitimate users of that data, then it is going to be abused. So data governance, security management become just as important as they were before. The cloud does not remove any of your security responsibility whatsoever. And in fact, um, it, it adds complexity because now you're not only managing devices that you have control over, you're now managing services some of which you have control over, but large portions of it underneath the, the surface. And so you do not have, you have to assume that those are compliant slash secure, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it, comes to, it comes down to instead of securing devices and hoping for the best, you now have to secure usage. Right. You have to ensure responsible use. You have to ensure, um, I mean, 
you still have to audit, you still have to monitor. You know, good news is the cloud service providers give you the tools to do that. But if you don't know how to use them or if you don't use them, you know, it's no less secure than anything else that you can do anywhere else. You cannot no abdicate. Secure. You cannot abdicate that no. responsibility. No, you absolutely cannot. Yeah. And so last question for you. Yeah. All right. There are lots of different cloud types. So you have everything from software as a service. You have infrastructure as a service. You have platform as a service and gradients in between. You know, people act like there's only three. No, there's many of oh, gradients yes, yes, in between. Absolutely. But the hard part is these organizations treating all in a standardized manner under service management. At least to me, that's the difficult is that we have to use a standardized service management program for SaaS like we would platform. Um, in fact, one of the, um, we did a lot of research into this and one of the core difficulties of moving to cloud, and there, there, there were a few of them, I'm gonna talk about one or two of them, but one of them was the ability to take existing service management processes and apply them in, uh, to cloud services. That is, that is still one of the biggest challenges. And part of that is because of the shared responsibility. You're no longer responsible for fixing stuff or taking care of stuff that you used to be. Um, I, the way I like to think of it is that, um, you know, IT people have become so used to being really good service providers, they haven't yet learned how to be customers. And this is, this is one of the things we have to do. In cloud services, if, if remember back to ITIL diagrams, there's a diagram which says, you know, there's a chain of service. You have a service provider and a customer, and then that customer becomes a service provider to the next customer in the chain. And the, so these little circles go, there's about five of them there. Well, what happens when you go to the cloud is that you move one circle across. You, you're, you're one step further down the chain towards your customer than you were before. You are now a customer in the chain. And I think one of the really difficult things for us as service managers is to learn to be a customer, to apply the, the, the practices that we used to use as service providers to become service consumers um, or service brokers. Right. And, and I think that's, I think that's part of it. Um, yes. And, and, and to be able to have service management systems that can scale across multiple types, in a sense, I, I think we've been doing this all along. I mean, we've had development teams, we've had infrastructure teams, we've had, you know, but, but now the, the issue is that these teams don't necessarily work for us anymore. They work for somebody else. So it's a matter of now, instead of aligning the processes, it's aligning the agreements. What, what's very interesting is that people will say to you, oh, come on, we did service level agreements, operating uh, operational level agreements. This is the 2020s, for goodness sake. Have we moved beyond that? Absolutely not. It become more important than ever before. It is critical that you know that this group depends on that service and that that service is managed by that team or supported by that team. These, now, I, um, fair enough, you may not want to view them as legal contracts, but somewhere along the line, you have to document, document whether that's in a tool or a piece of paper, it doesn't really matter, but somewhere you have to document what the expectations of one group to another group are and of both of those groups to the services that they consume and deliver. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, one of the mechanisms that comes out in the book, we don't cover it in a lot of detail because um, it's used in different ways uh, in different organizations, but it's this thing called a cloud management office. Mm -hmm. Uh, or a cloud center of excellence, or a uh, some people call it a vendor management office. But the, 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 the really important thing about that is that becomes an extension of what we used to call the service management office, where a um, service management office is not about implementing new processes. The service management office is about making sure stuff works. Right. Um, and that services are being delivered. And really a cloud management office is a type of service management office, but it has a little bit more to it in that it also manages contracts. And we get into a whole new area because contracts are now dynamic. They're not valid for five years anymore. They're valid by use. Right. 
And secondly, your usage of services is dynamic. Uh, and by the way, that's uh, another whole area that we have to touch on, which is the, the cost of cloud services. I think you touched on it right in the yeah. beginning. But it's, it's about forecasting what the utilization of cloud services are going to be so that we can understand what the kind of costs that are involved. Now, here's a big problem because we've separated our cost from return in IT at least, we can give you what the IT budget is. We can't tell you per service what the return on investment is. We can't do that. But for cloud, you have to. For cloud, you have to know, I'm gonna spend this much so that I can make this much. If I need to increase my usage of cloud services, is that gonna result in a direct surge in the return that I'm going to achieve? If it doesn't, why would I increase the use, right? right. You've got to be able to have that discussion, whether it's platform, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's software as a service. Um, to some extent, software as a service is a little bit more straightforward if you're talking about subscription. Um, but if you're talking about customizations and tailoring and, and <laughs> you know, well, that, that, that's another whole issue. But yeah, I, th I, think, I think there's a lot of pressure being put on us. To come back to your original question, to really focus on those higher order service management processes or practices, capacity management, for example, financial management, strategy, um, you know, those demand management, those things become absolutely critical when you're moving into the cloud. Uh, and that's the only thing that's gonna help you scale those different types of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of environment. So I want to build on what you said as we close, because you got me excited. So we have service management. We're trying to do things right. And we have a service, I'm making a finance and accounting that has some on-prem, some, yeah. some that's infrastructure as a service, you know, some on an AWS, and we have some SaaS, right? I mean, you'll have a service Absolutely, that yeah. has all of that. Yeah. And so you would have to map those services out because yep. the SLA is between IT and the business partner and then we have all these other different contracts to support that original SLA does that seem reasonable yep that's exactly right it's no longer you know a loose grouping of people who are working on best effort to deliver a service and uh, if it doesn't work it's not a problem we know to pick up the phone to and we can get action taken and we can get things reprioritized that doesn't exist anymore, right? right? You now have several different groups, some of whom work internally, some of whom are not even groups, they're simply faceless service that you're using from a service provider. And you, it is our job as IT professionals, as service management professionals to combine all of that into seamless services that meet business objectives. Uh, and, and yes, it's no longer informal. It's now formal. It now involves contracts. It involves payment. Uh, and not just payment that is, um, uh, you know, that is, um, what's the word, amortized over several years. Right. It's payment that comes off your bottom line. Yep. Be, you know, it's, it's real time. You use it, you pay for it, and that's it. So, you know, along with what I said earlier, you know, you have to be able to forecast for every component that you've just mentioned, you have to forecast if, how is that going to be used in my organization? And the only way you can do that is to sit down and figure out what each customer or user is doing. When they do that, what resources do they use and where do those resources come from? Only then can you predict what the cost is going to be? So if you make a mistake on your month end run and you have to do it twice, right? What is that going to cost you? And that's no longer on me as IT. You've just doubled the expense for the month end run. Um, so how can we stop that from happening kind of thing? Um, you know, uh, and you only know that if you can map all of those different components together all of those different contracts, all of those different agreements, all of the different internal team efforts, all of the internal devices, data, et cetera. And you can map it all to what is being done by that particular group of users. Yep. And th this is, uh, you know, service mapping has always been critically important 
it is also one of the most overlooked areas in service management. And the reason for that, I guess, is because uh, so many of the tool vendors have said, well, we have a CMDB. You don't have to worry about service mapping. It does it automatically. Yes. Well, it doesn't. Let's just flat out say it. CMDBs, as they are provided with auto discovery, do not provide service mapping. They may tell you that certain applications reside on certain hardware. They may even tell you what databases talk to each other. They do not tell you what all of those together are used to do in a business context. They don't yeah. tell you that. Because there's no way. There's there, no there way is. because how yeah. you define what accounting apps make that service in company X is not the same for company Y. And right. there's no... It's, and I would say even, I'm going to take it a step further, David, it's more art than science. And all these people oh, that think much. it's science, that's why it goes underappreciated, I think, is because very few people know how to do that. Well, we are, as, a, as, as an industry, we are science. Yeah. Um, I'm not. I graduated with a um, sociology degree and psychology degree. And so for me, one of the most important parts of my degree were uh, group dynamics. How do organizations behave? How do groups in organizations behave? And exactly the same principles apply to services because services reflect the patterns of behavior in, uh, in groups of people. You know, services are dynamic. Yep. Uh, and and this, is, this is the problem with taking an industry, an industry approach, you know, like, a, sorry, a manufacturing approach to managing IT. And manufacturing assumes a constant workflow uh, of standardized items. Um, that's not what IT is. IT is totally dynamic demand. It depends totally on what's going on in the organization at any given time. So you want to understand what services are doing and how they're being used. You have to understand the people. No tool. None whatsoever, not even the fanciest artificial intelligence tool does that today. Right. Yeah, yeah. there's no way for it to. <clears throat> this has no. been a great conversation, David. Thank you for telling us about the book because I do think that's a pain point, merging service management. How do we deliver great services or co-create great services, however you want to say it, to these cloud different varieties and because a lot of times these organizations, you know, from the business side are clamoring for a SaaS application or a platform or something of that nature. And so service management's having to make sure it all works. Yeah, not only that, but also reduce technical debt. Yes. So every time someone clamors for a cloud solution, when we have already invested in an in-house solution to do that thing, is potentially increasing technical debt. And if you can't map that and demonstrate that, then it's, you know, why would you, why would you possibly, how could you possibly stand in the way of people wanting to get a more business friendly application off the, off the internet? Right. Um, well, there are a lot of reasons, but it, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Any parting words, David? No, I think uh, I, you know, I, I think just uh, the just to to plug the book a little bit. I think um, it it is a book that is aimed at helping consumer organizations navigate this minefield. Um, it 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 does not paint anybody in a bad light. It recognizes the reality of the situation, and that is that cloud services and cloud service providers have a lot of good to provide that consumer organizations need to do their homework and this is the homework they need to do and here's how they need to do it and um you know doing that uh, you know following that advice you're able to achieve the promises of cloud uh, where and when cloud usage is appropriate right and it's all when appropriate it's there's yeah. no one size fits all and no. there's no, you know, it's all as appropriate. And so that we could talk for days, I think, on this topic, just because it's so intricate and it's so uh, you, end user and organization and leadership style dependent. Very much so. Very much so. This is not a technical discussion at all. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we found uh, a number of people who are involved in, in the beta program um, were not actually IT people and really found a lot of value 
uh, out of the materials. It is a book aimed at consumers of cloud services, no matter where they sit. So it's awesome. uh, a very exciting uh, piece of work. Yeah. It's awesome. Everybody check it out. You'll find it in your, at Axelos, all the IT, ITIL four places that you can find books. David, once again, thanks for joining us and uh, have a great day. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good to see you again. Have, take care. Bye.